Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Philip Greenish. Uh, I'm Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this event tonight, which is the second in the Academy's series of Technology Visionaries Lectures. And this evening we have the pleasure of hearing from Professor Nigel Shadbolt, who is one of the originators of the interdisciplinary field of web science. Before we start proceedings, uh, I'd just like to say a few words about the format for tonight's event. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Nigel, after which there will be an extended conversation uh, with him, which is going to draw out the themes of the lecture uh, and focus on his achievements and his visions for the future. There will be time for you to ask questions and to make your own points, uh, and I would urge you all to contribute. This part of the evening, I'm delighted to say, uh, will be chaired by Dr. Roger Highfield. As you may be aware, Roger was the science editor of the Daily Telegraph uh, for two decades, and he was then editor of The New Scientist between 2008 and uh, 2011, and he's now director of external affairs at the National Museum of Science and Industry, otherwise known as the Science Museum, or sort of. I'd also like to tell you that we're filming this uh, event tonight and the footage is going to go up on the Academy's website uh, within a day or two. My final point is one of housekeeping. Could I ask you all to turn your mobile phones off because they do interfere with the sound system uh, here in this lecture theatre. So without further ado, I would now like to hand over to Roger Highfield, who's going to introduce Nigel Shadwell. Roger. Right. Thank you very much, Philip. Well, welcome one, and welcome all to the Royal Academy of Engineering's Technology Visionaries Lecture Series. Now, it's a great honour to introduce this event at the Royal Society tonight with Nigel Shadbolt. Let me just give you a little bit of a background introduction to him. He's worked in artificial intelligence since the late 1970s, and he's now the Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Southampton, where he's also the head of the Web and Internet Science Group, which is also known as the Wasters, according to uh, Prof Shadbolt. Uh, Nigel is very prolific. He's co-authored more than 400 publications, and they stretch across a huge variety of fields, um, from cognitive psychology, computational neuroscience, and so on. He's commercially minded. In 2006, he co-founded a company called Garlic, to help consumers protect themselves from identity theft and financial fraud, and it was recently sold to Experian. He is literate as well. He's a true Renaissance man. He's co-authored a book called Spy in the Coffee Machine, Examining Privacy and Trust in the Digital Age. And if that's not enough, he's a visionary. Two years ago, the Prime Minister appointed him information advisor, along with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, to change access to public information. A year later, he joined the Public Sector Transparency Board, reflecting his passionate belief that the deluge of data generated worldwide at the moment is the raw material of 21st century life, commerce, and pretty much everything. And now he and Sir Tim are directing the Open Data Institute to give UK PLC a commercial advantage, hopefully over the rest of the planet. In fact, he sees the amazing tsunami of data out there as, in effect, the oxygen of the digital economy. So without any further ado, let me introduce Professor Nigel Shadbolt. Over to you, Nigel. Well, thank you very much. Um, this feels uh, very... Uh, for a conversation, there's a lot of people in the room, but I really do hope we'll have a conversation uh, uh, before the evening's out. I'm going to kind of give you a slightly filmic uh, experience as I rattle through slides. Uh, people who know me know I can get through a lot of slides. At about sli seven slides a second, it is a film. Um, but uh, it, there, is, there is a huge amount that, that one can say in this area. Um, first of all, about data. I, I, I'm passionate about data about this stuff. It's, it, it's, it's, for many, it sounds so dry, but of course we know that data itself was at the root of the rise of science. Uh, you go back, right back to the Copernican Revolution. Um, he uh, was both a great theoretician, 
and also an empiricist. He built great instruments. He sometimes trusted other people's data too much. Actually, some of the problems he encountered was because he actually trusted classical observations, which were not up to the same standards as his own, but the data was revolutionary um, in science. In engineering, we've been well aware of the importance of contribution of people like Harrison, uh, the kinds of clocks and watches that allowed us to keep, for the first time, accurate data about time. Or indeed, Babbage. Um, and of course, we know about the, uh, the difference engine, but his work on the dynamometer, the thing that actually allowed them to see how much vibration the great Western railways uh, generated. And, and sadly, uh, that uh, evidence, which was very much in their favor, didn't win out in the technology race. But the collection and generation of data has been a feature of both science and engineering. And just to say, it's still the same. And in fact, I think that in our age, the information age, the really interesting thing is how some of the really high impact work combines both of these faces. So it's a delight to be in the Royal Society. I'd be delighted to be talking as an Academy Fellow with the support of the Royal Academy of Engineering because these two chaps did great science to understand how you could represent the relevance of a page in a tractable formulation which could give you a rank of the most important pages that you could search against, but also build some engineering that would reduce the complexity of that problem to something that was commercially viable at the time. And that engineering and science went hand in hand, and too often, I think, we, we wonder whether we're one thing or the other. It seems to me that there's an extraordinary complementarity. And of course, many, many years ago, the Royal Society, the engineers were precisely uh, the people elected the artificers for building their instruments, collecting the data, as well as theorizing around it. Okay, a little kind of prelude. Um, data has extraordinary power. Um, and again, a very interesting paper. So much, in fact, that uh, it, in this uh, publication here, it was referred to as unreasonably effective. If you have data at enough scale, you can do remarkable things with it. This is actually a paper that appeared in Nature, uh, data from. Um, and these peaks and troughs here, uh, the actual uh, yellow line there is the data of actual outbreaks of flu in the United States that the Center for Disease Control published. And what the people from uh, this research uh, uh, were doing, they were looking, uh, uh, from Google Labs were doing, they were looking at search terms that were entered at the time and looking for a model fit between the actual outbreak of flu and search terms being looked for. Okay. And in fact, the process of detecting epidemics of flu in, uh, traditionally in America, it took about two weeks for the CDC to collect the data from all the primary health uh, visits, the physicians, to work out what the stats were. Uh, they produced a real-time model of actual search terms against the outbreak. Okay. Now, this is powerful stuff. Okay. You might ask yourself, how on earth can searching for terms correlate with outbreaks? Well, one just has to reflect on what people with a bad dose of flu are likely to be looking for when they're wondering about their symptoms or what they do or whether they should seek medication and so on. Here's some more data, actually. This might look like a high-altitude satellite shot. Um, actually, what it is, is a visualization of the Geo code of Flickr photos. So photos, you upload your uh, photos to the Flickr website, and it, if they have geo codes, it tags them with that photo. Remarkably, that structure is the actual geo code only for Flickr photograph photographers over a period of time in London. You can see quite clearly the Thames, the bridges the actual main thoroughfares, and that's because people are taking photos in places where people are, and of course, rather helpfully, often, they're tagging those photos. So with just a tiny bit of analysis and this amount of raw data, and in a sense it's raw, but you can already interpret its significance, you can find the top tourist destinations, they're labelled for you, you can rank them, you can organise them. This is powerful stuff. So the vision we have is often to turn this resource into something special. Now, 
some of you will have seen this before. I love this because it shows that it's not just about technology, it's about people collaborating together. And in a little sense, we saw that before with the fact that it was people taking those photographs. Okay, here we have a map of the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince, such as it was uh, uh, before the Haitian earthquake. Um, and it isn't very detailed. This is actually rendered in, a, in, a, in an open source product called OpenStreetMap. And actually what we see is that the... Oh, well, if I can reactivate this. What we'll see is that um, at the time of the earthquake, uh, people started to try and make their information available, collect it together. And in fact, particularly, they turned a number of satellites onto Haiti to get the visual, uh, the actual satellite grids. Here's the timeline, and we'll see, uh, helpfully, uh, it stops just at the relevant point. Okay, let me just hurry it along. Okay, there we go. Okay, that is the actual earthquake. And these uh, illuminations, it's just misbehaving, it's very typical of computer technology, isn't it? Um, this is a Mac. <laughs> um, these flashes we're seeing are actually uploads of data to the, um, to the actual OpenStreetMap site. So what we're seeing here, as I manually scroll it through, are lots and lots of people who are on the ground now after the earthquake with GPS devices and laptops uploading their data to the OpenStreetMap site. And of course what they're doing is collectively crowdsourcing a detailed representation of a city for which there was no map. Twelve days to build that structure. Twelve days and moreover it was essential that there be such a thing because all of the relief that was being flown into the place had to be mapped against meaningful terrain and features, of which there were not many. So the, the extraordinary thing here is the ability for people to collect data. And how does it become powerful? It becomes powerful when it is open. And so the product of people with open standards, open licenses, open data, and open source systems is to go from a parlous state here to a useful data structure here. And I believe this represents an extraordinary change in the ability of humankind to build value. So let me just show, give you an example now of what was happening in, in, in our open data work in the UK. Um, when we started this project, Tim and I, we actually had a, a, a little away day with the folks at The Guardian, and we imagined bill, uh, putting together a postcode paper which would actually have all the public sector data that might be of interest to your postcode, like the amount of crime, or when the buses ran, or where the allotments were, or what the uh, school attainment rates were. We produced this, took it to a cabinet session, no less, and got the benefit to kind of lay it in front of ministers, and they were thrilled and delighted, but a bit underwhelmed. It wasn't on the web, and uh, it was just a paper, and it was public data anyway, until we pointed out that we generated this off of machine data, so with this, any newspaper could produce a postcode paper digitally into a paper form, but sadly, about 80% of the content would, was illegally reproduced. We were breaking licenses. We weren't allowed to reproduce this data, even though this was all government collected data. And indeed, at that point, the postcodes were not publicly available without paying a uh, license fee. Uh, within three months, we'd launched our data.gov.uk site, which hosts uh, many, many data sets. And in 24 months, we now have a site where your point of entry is actually your postcode. Okay, and you get data associated with that. There's much to say about this in terms of the history. It was actually kicked off with an EPSRC-funded uh, project that we began in 2005, working with a part of government to show the opportunity of using new data standards to integrate information together. That was even reported to government in 2007. But the impetus was a meeting that Tim Berners-Lee had with the Prime Minister Checkers on one occasion when he was asked, what can we do to take advantage of the web? And Tim simply said, put your data on it. <laughs> and, uh, and when he said yes, because I'm not sure, <laughs> um, but he was, uh, 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 we had our opportunity, a huge opportunity to make progress. And that has continued. And the power of this idea is reflected in the fact that it not only survived contact with an election, 
But the Conservative Technology Manifesto before the election was talking hugely about the use of and uh, release of data sets. So this was an idea that had become uh, uh, non-partisan, which is hugely important. And since then, we've had huge support from politicians of all stripes, from... Uh, from uh, even, you know, Vice Commissioner of the, of the, of the European Union, uh, uh, that, uh, Nearly Kreuz, uh, developers, uh, civil servants. It takes people to achieve this, and it's really important to understand it's people from the top, from the bottom up, from the middle out. Why is this so compelling? Well, I've shown you examples like mapping Haiti or the example of, uh, of, 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 of the kind of structures you can see in large-scale data but it requires compelling stories. And here's a compelling story. Um, this is a picture of the bacteria of cholera. This is MRSA, okay, which uh, does uh, lots of damage in hospitals where people can acquire this. Back in the 19th century, John Snow published uh, for the first time, uh, he collected mortality data, put it onto a map, and noticed that the deaths in a cholera outbreak in London seemed to cluster around this water pump. First time people had understood that cholera was a waterborne disease. Changed public health policy forever. This was an effort to actually publish in league table terms openly the data of infection rates in hospitals. Guess what happened? Okay? Things started to improve with other effects that were taken into account uh, at the same time infection rates started to drop. Nobody wants to be at the bottom or top of those league tables, depending on which way you reverse them. In the same way, local councils, who are ranked in terms of how quickly they respond to fixing the streetlights or filling their potholes in, they kind of get on with it when the data is open to public scrutiny. So, um, why do people do this? Opening data that's publicly held, uh, uh, publicly paid for and held by government, there are all sorts of reasons, and in fact, in the early days of our effort, much of it was around um, transparency and accountability. Seems absolutely core principle, and why should we not? Um, also, there's an argument around improving public service delivery, uh, making your hospitals better, making the, uh, the roads more fit to drive on. Um, efficiency, the public sector itself can become a consumer of its own data. Remarkable how often uh, the public sector is held back because it can't get a view on the data that other departments in government hold that are material or relevant to it. Um, digital engagement, uh, data improvement, very interesting point uh, that I'll come back to uh, uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, and we can see the kind of societal values, uh, doing good because it's the right thing to do, but very uh, more recently the real interest has also been around can we generate economic value out of what was previously data held by government attracting no uh, additional uh, economic uh, uh, value to it? Okay, um, and there's another principle that has been advanced and there's very clear evidence for. If you put the data out there that government has, if you change their presumption to publish the data, then people build applications. You don't have to build them as a government because other people will think of things to do with your data that you never anticipated. It's the extension of the Bill Joy uh, 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 quote, you know, the smart people don't all work for you. <laughs> and actually people will be very ingenious and inventive around data sets. We've seen that many times. This is an idea that is now being widely emulated. So it's not just nation states, it's cities and local authorities putting data available as, as, as data stores. It's also all around the world. So the UK, the very first was the, was the US data.gov site, Obama's administration back in uh, uh, the January of 2009 uh, made the, uh, began this. Ours was the second, Australia, New Zealand, but now we have Kenya, we have Moldova, Kenya, Chile. Many, 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 many countries now taking this approach that the public data should be made available for general benefit. So we've achieved a lot. We've achieved a lot in terms of uh, the data sets that have been released, the principles behind them, getting licenses that allow you to reuse in any way you should choose that data. And an important area I have to kind of refer to here is 
all of, usually everything happens somewhere. So the really key data sets for us were location based. Now I've showed you examples of applications built using open source products, open street maps. But of course we have the Ordnance Survey, uh, a national institution, great quality data. And it's now uh, uh, possible to get substantial amounts of their data and use it for the common uh, uh, good for free without let or hindrance. And this is fabulous. This is actually the postcodes, the administrative geography of the country. That's what so many applications need. Just the range of products here. Um, everything from vector maps to street gazettes to uh, code point, the actual uh, uh, um, uh, postcode details themselves, elevation data available to download and, and use. And each time I go to a meeting, I see somebody else doing something remarkable with that. Um, some very nice work at UCL uh, in, the, uh, in Mike Batty's group. This is a, um, uh, a nice visualization of cycle journeys. Uh, the thickness of the lines relate to more journeys. And the red are lead pollution levels. Okay. And so they're showing you clearly where the kind of highly cycle traversed but polluted spots are. And they're not, they're the usual suspects, Aldwych, uh, around here, uh, Trafalgar Square, such like. But I mean, this is the kind of stuff that once visualized gets people mobilized, makes them think, does it have to be like this? Uh, another, f uh, actually, when you look at the data being used here, uh, the OS vector products being used, uh, open data from the London data store is being used, and so on. This is the mobilization of open data. Here's a one I really like. This is actually uh, inspired by Charles Booth's map, which is a 19th century map of social deprivation in London. Now, uh, this was really detailed work. They went into every household to determine the level of actual economic uh, affluence and a house by house analysis. This is using uh, national uh, 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 statistics, uh, uh, UK statistics. But it's using, again, the building outline form, the map from the OS. And here we can see the score, most deprived areas up through uh, least deprived areas. Probably no surprises there. Okay. But it's very interesting to see how powerful these integrations can become. And then you ask yourself, what about other data sets? We've managed to remarkably uh, release crime data, uh, report a crime every month to the street level. Okay, probably the most, it is the most visited website the government's ever built, hundreds of millions of visits. So every month, um, hundreds of thousands of reported crimes are uploaded. Now this is uh, the postcode for our neck of the woods at the University of Southampton, and this is the first month of data. Uh, the two things, this heat map's spot, um, plotting two things, it's plotting ASBOs, antisocial behaviour orders, and violent crime. Those are the two. Uh, uh, but we can switch all sorts of uh, uh, data sets on and off. In fact, this is due to Jean-Luc, uh, one of my uh, research fellows here in the audience. Uh, so credit there. Um, and watch uh, January, February. Now just watch what persists. March, April, May, June. You can see it's the kind of the usual suspects. They peak, they bloom, they blossom. One of the remarkable things about that map is... So now it's available, policemen themselves use it. They have a better view of what was going on than the previous analytics they would have had. They can visually interrogate a straightforward application on their iPad or back at base and see a sense of, well, those of us from Southampton will be very familiar with this little part of the world. Uh, our building's down here. This is around the Flowers Estate. And if I overlaid index of multiple deprivation, you would see some striking correlations. Enough to say. Now, you know, the interesting fact about this is the data there allows it uh, to be rendered and realized. Um, cities are particularly interesting, we notice, because of the fact that they are significant data generators. And one of the very exciting developments is around the whole concept of the open data city. And I believe Greg Hadfield may be here in the audience who's, who's running an event around this whole concept and is trying to get mobilization around the idea of what cities can do because sometimes they have authority over their own data that national data, national government doesn't have. 
So in London, uh, it was Boris Johnson's decision to release uh, 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 TFL data that allowed an awful lot of development in the area of the great traffic apps you've now got, people giving us great applications to, to catch the bus just in time that leaves from here when the lecture finishes. And these are, the, the, these are great examples. Okay, I'm going to say in the time that remains, something around the technology here. Um, we have been very keen to push, and some people think this is, um, this is, this is very exotic stuff. Um, I, we don't refer to the semantic web now. That's a little bit too incendiary for some people. Um, it's actually, we talk about the linked web of data. Uh, it's funny how terms can feel more comfortable, although it's essentially the semantic web. Okay, and this is an idea that data, when you release it, structured data, um, to count as open in, in Tim and I's view of the world, you've got it, you can put it on the web, you can put it on the web even in a PDF, you can put it on the web in, in a graph or a, or, a, or, or, a, or, or a picture, a JPEG, but you must give it an open license, then it's open. Okay. You get a star for that. If you make it available as a structured data, so you turn the data inside your document into a table, even if it's an Excel spreadsheet, you'll get two stars. If you use a proprietary, non, if you use a non, uh, a proprietary format, like a CSV representation of your spreadsheet, you'll get three. And if you take one more step, you allow us to begin the journey to link data. You allow us to begin to represent data computationally in a way which is highly reusable. It's the simple device of giving your data, each item of your data, a web address, essentially, that can be dereferenced. And if we can link those together, we really get motoring. Let me show you what I mean. Here is high quality linked data from the Ordnance Survey. And in fact, this is their administrative geography. Um, and what this, 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 this rendering is showing me is what I get back if I were to type in the URI, the web address, for a particular part of the British administrative geography. This is a ward in the UK. Uh, and here's all the associated properties uh, that that ward has. And they themselves will have URIs. So I build a linked description of, of this data. We now have URIs for schools and roads and bus stops and postcodes. And if we can get this spreading out, we build a digital national infrastructure that has huge potential value. So uh, we can build applications uh, such as this one from, uh, from, from, from Southampton where I can now take uh, the, uh, the, the, the particular postcode, I can give you a representation of particular crime types, but I could show you the incidence of bus stops or uh, or, or, or what the absenteeism was in schools, because I've got three ministries of state publishing some of their data in this link format. Okay. Now, this allows us to move from our current web of documents to supplement it with something we call the web of data. And that's a device in the same way that Tim was able to take a chaotic system of document management systems pre his specification of the web, and put a, a layer of standardization on top of the internet, HTML and HTTP, and he abolished the tyranny of those document management systems. So you could click on a link and go to a document the other side of the world and retrieve content. Imagine that world applied to data, the data in your spreadsheets or your databases or your documents themselves. And so in fact, the principles that we're trying to advance are simple, simple generic principles of how you represent data. And in fact, these micro principles we wrote up in a pilot paper, they pre-existed pre this, Tim had formulated them earlier, four simple principles. If you look at the core principles in the web architecture, there, aren't, there are about four or five. Okay. And the great thing about lightweight standards and protocols, they can scale. Okay. But it does require you to think about giving your key information and data assets URIs, web addresses that will persist through time. Okay. And that's an interesting business and government challenge. So here's an example of one. Uh, this is a URI for me, uh, 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 my representation in, uh, in Southampton speak. Uh, this is a particular project or a publication or a school. Um, 
And in fact, I can't ensure that everybody will use the same web address for me. So perhaps there's somebody else who's invented a dis designation for me um, in a uh, electronic uh, uh, publications house somewhere. But then I can actually build technology to notice these are the same thing. Um, we can link them together, in other words. So if I give a, a piece of data or data a web address, when I drop this into a browser, it will give me the underlying data back. Okay. And that, in turn, will be linkable. And so I have a graph of connected data in the same way we have a graph of documents currently. There is a language to support this. It's a very, very simple knowledge representation language. People thought it was barely good enough, but it is remarkably powerful if used. The resource description framework that allows me to represent my data in this way. And if I can link these things together to recognize that this is the same reference, this same object in the world as this, then I can build search engines based on this. I can build services based on this. And I observe the emergence of the linked web of data. One of the very earliest to be built was this representation of Wikipedia as linked data. So all those facts about people, places, and events extracted and linked together as, as, as actual uh, uh, underlying data. There's a, t uh, a whole methodology to do that. And it became a point at which lots of other data sets linked in. So this is an open source geographic uh, place and names gazette. Uh, this is actually a resource that describes all the artists and CDs it knows of in the world, and there are a great deal of them, all using the same underlying representations. And of course, events and artists are going to have representations in Wikipedia. So you'll see cross links between data in this resource and data in that resource. This was back um, in the, uh, well, not so many years ago, a couple of few years ago, uh, as of 2008, it was growing, and it started to grow and grow and grow, okay? And when you see phenomena exploding like that, each of these bubbles contains millions and millions of triples of underlying data, okay? And they begin to take, connect together, and you get a network effect, the network effect of data reinforcing the value of other data by being present. So the ambition is to imagine creating this world, creating this world in which public data is so represented and connected together. And there is hugely more, I could say. Uh, I've been speaking according to this for 27 minutes, um, and I've been told I will stop in 30 minutes because we're going to have a conversation now. Uh, but I'm going to give you a really filmic experience now because there's much I can't talk about. Um, the government uh, is in the UK is still committed to this. Just in the autumn statement, significant new data releases were, were, were announced. The, public weather the data underlying the public weather service from the Met Office, a whole range of new transport data, health data, our Open Data Institute, Institute was announced. There are issues, and I'm sure we may touch on them in the, in, in the, in the discussion. All this data, tons and tons of data, what's the government infrastructure that ho holds it and hosts it? Where does it live? Okay, who looks after it? Um, how good is it? You know, government data, actually government data, all data is never quite as good as people would wish it to be. Uh, when we published the famously where all the bus stops were, <laughs> there were 360 odd thousand, we discovered that uh, 17,000 of them weren't where the government thought they were. Okay. <laughs> and that really is irritating when you're turning up for your bus. Um, but of course, the people knew where they were. So what do you do? You crowdsource the improvement of your data. But how do we build a process where that can happen reliably? And there is a big issue around people wishing to interpret your data in different ways. This is not a new problem. Okay, this is what journalists do. It's what politicians do. Here's some data. I'm going to actually interpret it different than you. But well, if the data is published and we understand what it's representing, we can contest that interpretation. And indeed, a big issue around privacy and security. What are you doing as you publish more and more of this information in terms of the potential of identifying assets of value or indeed uh, individuals uh, themselves? I'm sure we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, lots of things we can't talk about, sadly. I will talk about this final point. It isn't just this data revolution about non-personal public data. 
there's work going on even as we speak to think about getting consumers their data back from both the governments and organisations who have it. Now, when we say their data back, you can make a subject access request to, uh, to an organisation and pay them some money and wait 20 days. If you've written them a letter, and you might get it back. This is medieval. Okay. So why can't we get our data in a machine-readable format that we can decide what we do with, and perhaps we can even imagine new classes of service? This is the basis of the My Data project, which I'm uh, helping chair for the government. And the idea would be that we get the information from utility companies and from uh, retailers and uh, telecoms and whoever has it, get it back to the individuals whose data it is. This isn't openly published. This is to people whose data it is. And they can decide to do various things with it. They might, for example, decide to get together as a group and go back and bid for a collective purchase of heating oil from a supplier of, uh, of heating oil. This happens informally now, but imagine if there was an app on your phone to just make that happen. So the world is changing, um, and we do see, um, I believe, opportunities that open data on the web can be a platform for modern government. The question I would ask of us all is, can it be a platform for science, engineering, education, business? Is this a new era we're moving into? I think it is. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Nigel. That was brilliant. You promised us a filmic experience. We ended up with a thriller, data of power. Fantastic. Now, we're going to have um, a Q&A session right at the end of the evening, but I'm going to pitch in with a few questions first. But when you get your turn, there will be some microphones roving around. Um, I want to actually start off just by stepping back a bit from open data and addressing a sort of universal issue we're all worried about, which is where the next generation of data evangelists are going to come from. And I'm always really interested to find out you know, what got people interested in science and engineering and technology in the first place. So, you know, when you were in short trousers, Nigel, what got you thrilled about computers and so on? Oh, gosh. Well, actually, it, it wasn't the computers back then, because sadly I'm, too, I'm so old that uh, uh, I even predate okay, the, uh, the, the, the Sinclair Scientific. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, it was that, the, that first scientific calculator that really got me thinking, wow, these are something smart. But before that, I used to spend time looking through telescopes and looking at the stars, and it seemed to me there were about three really interesting questions, right? You know, how are we intelligent? Is there intelligence out there, and could we build it? And so that whole, my, my intellectual journey was, has been around what the principles and foundations of, 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 uh, of, of intelligence. And in fact, I didn't initially imagine I would be dealing with AI or computers. Mm -hmm. um, I went, my first degree is philosophy and psychology, because I thought I was going to find the answers to that question in the study of, of, of the human mind and what philosophers had thought about that. And of course, I, I, went, I, I kind of went to hear about this and discovered that there was an extraordinary uh, um, movement to try and automate um, intelligence. Went on to Edinburgh to do a PhD in AI. And so that was the journey that got me into the proximity of computers. And so I can't think of more thrilling questions than, mm. than, than what varieties of intelligence there are. And um, I actually think that we, we now see a new one, which is a new kind of AI, which is, which is uh, augmented intelligence, because we didn't imagine when we began AI a web and people connected together at scale to solve problems collectively. So when you visit schools, I'm sure you must on occasion, or when you hear about what's happening at schools, do you, do you feel that things are being done the right way, or do you kind of hold your head in your hands and groan? Well, what do you think about teaching uh, IT at schools? Well, there, there are some great teachers, but that, uh, also famously, actually, there's a report just out, a, a joint uh, uh, academies report from the Royal Society and the Royal Academy on on the state of IT teaching in schools, and it's and it, and it, and, it, and it's pretty stark in its assessment that uh, it's broke, um, that it's really just about teaching IT literacy skills, uh, and that if we want to get serious, we've got to think about teaching what some people have called computational thinking, that computational literacy is as important as every other kind of literacy. And I think that that applies to data literacy. I think we can't live in a data-intensive world and not have it permeate our curricula. 
So I'd like to see our, our school kids using some of these open data sets in their human geography and economics projects. And what about a connection with actual coding and things like that? When you, you use a computer nowadays, you feel terribly remote from Fortran and BASIC and all the classic uh, languages. Well, you know, if I had my way, they'd be taught AI, of course, because that... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I think, seriously, I think that actually... Um, Engaging people to understand what it is to be a representation and how you can automate that and reason over it mm. is, is a really exciting journey. And when you realise that, I mean, people have done this in robotics somewhat. You know, you can engage a kid's interest when they're building their kind of Mindstorms Lego robots and programme them. But, you know, to infiltrate it into our curricula so that when you're thinking about your history or your actual uh, geography, you may be thinking in terms of... Because in our universities, so many people are now computational biologists. They're computational um, musicologists, even. So I think we can do so much more to teach the principles that underlie... Uh, representation and, and algorithm, because I think these are at the heart of a huge amount of what's making the world change. So let's move on to open data. Now, I've got to ask you the trillion dollar question. Who's really going to get the most out of open data? Is it going to be government? Is it going to be business, the public, society at large? Uh, the, well, the, the cheap answer to that is all of them, uh, because I think that they all stand to gain. Um, and we've already seen the benefits as they accrue to government, um, sometimes uncomfortably, uh, uh, but uh, I know of, for example, local councils who, by publishing their data, have saved themselves money, not least because they don't have to service irksome freedom of information requests, because it's there, they point to the data set. Uh, CEOs who, for the first time, have real um, insight into the actual spending of their council, um, typically the, the province of the financial officer. Um, so there, I think the public, they, they notice, or sometimes don't notice, when the application on their iPhone makes a difference to their life. So the, mm. the app that gets them to that bus in time or onto the uncrowded uh, uh, underground platform, that makes a difference in their life. Um, the real question is, has business really opened up to the opportunity here? Um, and I think, again, we're seeing inversions. Traditionally, businesses made their money out of the 20% giveaway and the 80% you sold. And I suspect in many areas that model is being reversed. And the, and, and the, and, and the power is in giving much more away for larger value uh, to be created and concentrating on the high-end service value. But, of course, if you're a member of the public and you're, you're wallowing in this ocean of open data, you're trying to make sense of it, and you've got tools there to help you, uh, just to return again to the education theme, there is a worry about the lack of general numeracy in the population. I think the Daily Telegraph's even got a campaign about it. Um, and the book Freakonomics even warned us about the risks of... Um, it's very easy for people to assume causality in trends they might see when they see data sets presented to them. Um, do, you, do you think we equip people sufficiently to, to really benefit the most from the open data revolution? Well, that takes us back to the education piece, which is why I think this is such, such an important issue that we have to do that. that uh, um, and the challenge here is to understand that... Um, it, in a sense, it's natural that some of the early advocates, they will be the activists and the developers. And so in the open data world, it's that developer community that has been carrying uh, much of the, the battle forward and showing what can be done and achieved. But there's a wider interest, as you say. People are interested and intrigued. And as we see what happens, uh, as more and more of this, the tools are made available to allow people to explore, it's important they're exploring with a sense of what... Uh, the, what, what, what is sensible to interpret in the data. So what's a fair sample? How was this reported? This is reported crime. Is it actually... A, how, how reliable is that data? And those questions are questions that any good scientist or engineer would, would, would want to ask from the beginning of their training... And I believe those skills need to be pushed out much, much more widely. So you think actually it could almost have an educational effect? I mean, I, I can think of plenty of government 
data that's a little bit strange. You know, there's discussion of uh, reoffending rates, for example, when it's really reconviction rates, I mean, uh, and all the rest of it, and manipulations of data that go on. So perhaps it will have a benefit there. Yeah. But of course, there is a flip side to this, which is where we are also concerned about privacy issues. Um, you've got, you've written about this, inspiring the coffee machine, and so on. So, how do you get that balance right between um, open data for all and yet giving people that sort of envelope of privacy? I mean, coming back to your your point on the. Um on, 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 on the education piece. I mean, I do think the other great thing that the web gives us is an ability for lots of eyeballs to get on the data. Mm -hmm. So you have contested arguments about whether or not that story that ran in that paper was a sensible interpretation of the data. And if the base data's out there, you can have that discussion. Um, and, and then, of course, it's a, it's a matter of how convinced people are by the arguments. Um, the issue around privacy, I think, is a really crucial and vital one because when Kieran O'Hara and I were, wrote this spy in the coffee machine, we were, we were talking about the notion of what it is to be private. Now, it's interesting that in the medieval village, there wasn't, so, there wasn't too much privacy about, you know. Mm. Um, that in a sense, privacy was a product of partly the industrial rev revolution, the mass movement of people into cities, the fact that it became a political concept around your ability to be autonomous, to have conversations in private and not be persecuted for those, those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we now live in this technological era, which is, some people have called it the panopticon, you know, that all seeing, that our devices record where we are, that people uh, uh, can, can interpret and infer what we've been doing. But that doesn't mean because the data is simply available that it can be used in any way whatsoever. So I think this is partly about moving us to a view that says we should have a reasonable expectation to privacy. And that means just because you have the photographs, you're not free to publish them or use them to make a decision against you as an individual. And I think, I think that's the way to begin to shape this kind of discussion. In other areas, it will be about issues around de-anonymization. You know, have you released a data set with sufficient confidence that uh, it won't be quickly Well, I can think these sort of issues have been rehearsed a lot, say, in medical data and genomics data, and it astonishes me when I think of the genome race, billions spent by the public uh, genome initiative and, uh, and yep. hundreds of millions by Venter, and now maybe for a few hundred dollars you can get the same data it's got huge potential to understand an individual and there's a big tension there between that individual privacy and mining that data for medical insights i think so that's on. right but i mean the, the, the way we have to conduct this conversation it has to be a conversation with society at large in much the way that i've said in the past that we had this conversation with the Warnock Commission around the potential for stem, bio, stem cell research and, and, and embryology. And we, we imagined where the technology might take us and thought about what we might need to do in that space. I think in the privacy space, we have to, we have to kind of forearm ourselves and also start to imagine that um, it, w it has to be consent oriented, that it's a really dangerous place to be uh, simply uh, deciding that the greater benefit can simply be decided by just a few people when actually it's a, a wider societal discussion that it has to have. If you have that discussion, then you will very often find the public come to a very reasoned view that yes, there is a greater cause here. There's, a, there's the benefits of medical research and, and, and people's lives can be helped by this. Yeah. And they'll share a lot of information. And also you'll share a lot of information with people like you. So if you have a particular uh, medical condition and you have a social network site that allows you to get together with people with a similar condition, you're prepared to share amongst that group in a way that you wouldn't necessarily with others. So it's a very nuanced argument that needs to be had, but the conversation needs to happen. Well, I'm very aware of the fact we're trying to cover a huge amount of territory, and I really want the audience to have uh, an opportunity to... Um, jump in with some questions. So I'm going to pitch just one more question because of course um, the semantic web, this extension of the web in which um, you're giving information, well-defined meanings and you're, you're trying to get people and computers to work more together. You're doing more research on that at the moment. Just briefly give us a feel for what, what you're up to. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got about uh, two minutes yes, then I'll open yeah, it up yeah. to the floor. Um, 
Well, one of the really interesting uh, challenges is how you actually, if you're building this large web of distributed data, how do you interrogate it? How do you query it? How do you, what's the data access language for this web look like? And how can you build tools that allow you to visualize and pull it back? Um, how do you trust it when you've got it back? So what's its provenance? Uh, can you work out if you're going across paywalls or IP wars, any kind of sensible regime there. And, and more generally, there's the fact that we notice that most of the really powerful <laughs> systems involve increasingly people and machines collaborating. And where you offload some of the hard-to-do computing from a computer to a human with their exquisite human capability and then reintegrate it back into a, a computer fabric, you've got something that, that actually Tim Berners-Lee called originally the social machine. So you and think we're all going to be shackled to mechanical Turk in well, two decades I don't time think, or something? Yes, I mean, that's one expression of it, uh, but I don't think everybody wants to just be paid a few cents for transcribing doctor's uh, mm. uh, uh, kind of uh, recordings. Um, I think you'll see, and you see it now in citizen science, people being uh, uh, recruited into looking at loads and loads of pictures of obscure deep sky objects, and they can learn to classify them really fast. Or they can be looking at old uh, uh, ship time records that were written uh, uh, in the 19th and 18th century, and they can work out the latitude and longitude, and they can read the handwriting and take the pressure readings and the temperature, and you can backfill your climate record. That kind of engagement with systems, databases, algorithms and people is, I think, a very exciting uh, new area of research. It's a great place to uh, end this part of the, the evening. And now just to invite the audience, um, we've got a couple of microphones. Who would like to... Here, look, we've got a gentleman in the front, brave soul in the front, who's going to be the first to pitch a question. I don't know if we've got another microphone. Any, anyone over here who wants to ask a question? Can we get this gentleman here as well? Um, Far away. Apropos of your very last point, um, by the way, very interesting, fascinating lecture, but um, how, do we, how do we avoid the TripAdvisor problem in connection with your, your last comment? And if people aren't aware of it, there are an awful lot of fake um, commendations and, and rubbishings on TripAdvisor. Yeah, and it, it, it's a really... Whenever you see a phenomena at web scale, uh, it's rapidly followed by kind of spam or splogs or link farms. So for every big phenomena on the web, there have been a bunch of people looking to kind of subvert or repurpose or redirect attention somewhere else. And interestingly, of course, that arms race between those people and the computer science researchers very often are trying to work out, is this a genuine uh, actual post? Can I to tell the spammer from the, uh, from, from, from the self-promoter, from the genuine uh, 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 recommender? And actually, there are really interesting techniques developed to kind of tell spammers from real users in all sorts of areas, from recommender systems through to tagging systems. Uh, but the TripAdvisor is an interesting example because um, the question there is, Who's generating these false reports? Uh, how can their authenticity or provenance be tracked back? Um, and we've got methods in some systems like Amazon, you know, the, the, the star rating systems, where if, if the method's being dealt with fairly, you've at least got some sense of whether you're seeing reality. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, very, it's a pressing point, and it will be a, a constant battle. Mm. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you thought that there was an opportunity for business to take up um, these techniques. I mean, interestingly, one area of business, particularly marketing um, on the web, um, is, of course, extremely interested in any data it can get from, and will try a number of different subterfuges in order to obtain it. I guess my concern regarding privacy is our increasing ability to join very large data sets, some from legitimate open data sources, um, others from elsewhere. And in a sense, even though you may judge an individual data set, to carry no information uh, or, uh, or no substantial information that, that has a, a privacy impact, I think it's going to be increasingly impossible to assess whether a particular data set in conjunction with other data sets, some of which you know about and some of which you don't, can be joined with the various big data techniques to infer uh, essentially personal data um, without actually being aware of that, that possibility. This, this is happening, and, mm. and this will happen. 
So the question is, can we roll back the tide or can we imagine developing conventions, regulations, social norms where actually uh, you're held accountable for what you do with that information. So the whole area of accountable computing says uh, you may be able to do this but we need to see that it's happened and we've got to understand whether it's proportionate in some sense. Um, but this has been going on for a very long time, as you say. It's the basis of micro-segmentation in marketing. You know, they, everybody knows everything about you except perhaps your name, but they know exactly what you're likely to buy or be influenced by. Um, and, and I think we've got to imagine the trade-off in a world in which we get recommendations, we're given advice as against the information they hold about us. And, uh, and that's part of this general conversation. I'm not sure we can draw the legislative boundaries carefully enough in this fast evolving world to decide between this class of inferred data and that class of inferred data. I think it's a matter of, of, of convention and um, what, and different countries deal with this in different ways as well of course, so that's another interesting element in this. But um, it, it has to be clearly understood that these effects, these mosaic effects are going to happen. I was like, oh. Sorry, relying on codes of conduct or whatever, if you can't legislate, and I agree that that would be impossible to do, um, hasn't shown itself to be very effective in such exploitation of data to date. And the big data techniques that are now becoming feasible will only exacerbate, I think, Well, it depends situation. how rigorously those things are policed or, 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 or brought to public attention. I, I think that's, if it becomes a cause celebre, much as uh, people uh, have suddenly become very unhappy with applications that simply mine your address book on your, on, on, on your mobile phone. Let's have two more questions. Gentleman here and gentleman over here. Um, you fire away first. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I had a question about intellectual property. Do, do you think there is a place for the individual creator anymore in, in a world where there's such a pressure to make data open and there's so many effects from crowdsourcing? Um, is it possible for, outside the academic community, for an individual artist or creator actually to make money from what they do rather than having it just mashed up by somebody else or Google or Facebook make no, money I, from I, advertising? I, I think it clearly still is. There's still a huge role for individual creativity and, and, and genius, and, and God long may it remain so. It's just interesting that the, the issue is around what you do with collective rights or collective authoring, and it's, it's a hard area. Uh, people think about it quite hard. I mean, who do you, you know, where, where are the liabilities in these collective uh, uh, contents? Not just the rights, but where are the responsibilities? So um, this is an active area. One of the reasons we called web science into being was in a sense because of the need for interdisciplinary perspectives on just these questions, that we have to get the IP lawyers, the people thinking about these issues, at a societal level uh, to understand where this world is moving to. Uh, Nico McDonald, um, I, would it be cherished for me to note that the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering event doesn't have a unique URI? They say that <laughs> and I will chide them for it. Yes. It is true, yes. I'm sorry to say. Um, but on a more positive note, um, I attended uh, Tim Berners-Lee's talk, The Future of the Web, which the Oxford Internet Institute, Internet Institute hosted in 2007. And I have to say, I'm very pleased that the way you're talking about things today is much more meaningful, particularly in terms of scenarios, to the rest of the world, should we say. Um, one thing I've done a lot of research on and writing about is visualization of data and modes of interaction and interrogation of data through visual interfaces. And I wondered who, what, if and who you were working with in that area to help people better interrogate data and understand the power of linked, open linked data. If you go back to uh, work done by Ben Schneiderman at the University of Maryland in the last 20, 30 years, and up to the work done by David McCandless, journalist turned graphic designer who's really become a poster child for this uh, work, I, I will observe that information visualization always looks good, whether it's actually useful or not to people is another question, which is something else which you would have a particular view on. So are you working with people in this area, and if so, how? Well, absolutely. I mean, right back to Tuft, of course, and all of that great work on, on, on what it is to meaning, meaningfully convey information uh, visually uh, or in graphic form. And, and you know, you've mentioned two, 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 two great examples there. I think we have to develop the area of, 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 of human interaction and UI to this new kind of space where it's, 
it's not just having a particular set of pretty bolt-ons. It's something much more about how you can engage with how people make sense of information in terms of the kinds of visualizations that are being offered. So, I mean, actually, the spatial analytics I showed you from Mike Batty's group at UCL would be a great example of that. And we absolutely need to be working with them. And in, in, in many areas in my own group, we, we, we have a lot of specialization around people who try and meet the challenge of building adaptable, repurposable uh, visualization tools. But there's a huge amount to do in this space. And um, yeah, huge amount to do. We're almost out of time. Is there someone who's desperate? There's one chap who's desperate to ask a question. Okay, two more very quick questions here, but keep it really short. No mini speeches, okay? <laughs> um, I was just wondering, one of, one of your principles uh, from your, your original paper uh, for the four principles of semantic web was RDF and XML as the format. And in, in the, what I've seen is a huge amount of data which meet some of the other principles, but maybe it's a spreadsheet, as you say, maybe there's other things. So that most of the work that I've seen of people building on the data source being made available, it's always some smart hacker yep. in a lab or in a bedroom working this out for themselves and scraping it and, and, and working with it. So we're long, sorry, long way, it seems to me, from the machines really being able to navigate the web of linked data. Can you talk to that at all? No, I mean, that is part of the challenge. I mean, we have, we have in our control sand pits, we can do it quite compellingly, uh, but the toolkits that, to allow the geeks in the basements to be doing this just as well are still a serious uh, um, 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 challenge. I would say that the power of these formats is their, is their, is their, is their universality uh, in principle. But of course, the reality is that lots and lots of developers love their scripting languages, and they're going to have a different way of representing structured data. What we need to have is a variety of ways to export and expose data formats. There won't be just one preeminent one. It turns out that RDF is ever so useful for lots of other reasons, not least it allows you to represent uh, ragged data. You can build uh, databases without pre-existing data schema, that, but that's another argument. Yep. Very last question just over there. Yeah, hi. I'm um, IT director, I'm already working with, with open data, exposing um, hospital episode data to pharmaceutical companies. Um, I was in, you, you had some pretty good visualizations on some of your slides, and I was just wondering if you could give some examples of if you knew some of the technologies that, that you knew you were aware um, for exposing that, that some of the mapping tools, for example. Uh, we're using Microsoft technology at the moment to, to you know, present the data to our customers, and we're just, just wondering if there's any... There are, I mean, there are interesting efforts. I mean, the, the Many Eyes project, which was IBM sponsored, was an interesting idea where it tried to crowdsource lots and lots of visualizations, but, you know, they need to be available as open source components for everybody else to kind of harvest and download and use and extend. Um, various forms of, 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 of visualization underlying toolkits uh, uh, are available. I mean, uh, one of our issues is that it would be great if there were more powerful, if you like, open source component sets to begin to do some of this. Because it's a lot of work to build yet another heat map, to build yet another kind of uh, uh, um, self-organizing network representation. Um, and I think that's an area where we could do more to develop the community to share um, 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 uh, uh, development efforts and insights. And again, make it open source. I mean, one of the really challenging things for the ordnance survey will be to get all that great data that's made open available in good development kits for mobile phones. <laughs> you know, just because that's going to be the, the, the platform of choice for which many people want to see the visualization or the app rendered. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave the very, very last word to Philip Greenish, who's going to come back from the Royal Academy. But while he's wending his way up to the podium, you are a professor of artificial intelligence. <laughs> We've seen the answer in Hollywood movies. But Nigel, what's going to happen in 20 years' time for AI? Come on, just, just a couple of glimpses of the future. Well, uh, <laughs> almost certainly... You're not to say Terminator-style No, 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 no. I mean, what, I don't believe quite in the, uh, in the singularity, the kind of, you know, <laughs> transcendental uh, tr uh, kind of uh, change of humanity into a digital form. I, I think definitely uh, Moore's Law has been extraordinary. I mean, we, if you just extrapolate out, you can get a sense of what the information densities will be, how fast the processing is going to be. In that world, 
where computing, where you're immersed in computing device, where people have learned to collaborate with their computing environments in much more joined up ways. So in some sense, we become, the, this sounds terrible, the subroutines of other collective uh, action. We're going to see... Like no, something. it's not the board, because we're all, <laughs> we're all essentially ourselves, but collectively we can solve problems at scale that no individual could. And I think that's the, what that will lead to, of course, is hard to discern. Um, and I think in the meantime, there'll just be some fantastic stuff going on in terms of the programs available, the device engineering, uh, robotics. Uh, you know, um, 20 years ago, when I started in AI in, in, in the late 70s, we were convinced that we would never have enough understanding or power to beat a resident world chess champion. You know, and every time it gets knocked over. The glory of human intelligence, though, is not something we're going to see in silicon in 20 years' time. That's in here now. Thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant, actually. I think we should just give Nigel a quick round of applause and then hand over to... Well, Roger, I'm really glad you asked that last question. It did strike me as you were asking it that on that table in front of Nigel is a vase which is almost the shape of a crystal ball. Now, if you had gazed into it, would we have got the same answer? I don't know. Uh, almost Im an impossible question to answer. And I certainly, uh, I think along with most people 20 years ago, had an almost impossible task of trying to imagine where uh, the web was going to, to take us. So looking 20 years ahead is, is, is hugely challenging. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, the evening is going to uh, conclude with a drinks reception in the City of London rooms just next door uh, where we were before, and everyone is, is welcome to that, and N Nigel will be there, and you'll be able to ping him for, for more questions uh, if you would like. But before we do break, there are a couple of things that I, I would like to, to say. The first is to to give my thanks to the Royal Society for allowing us the use of, of their lecture theatre. Uh, our own building at the Royal Academy of Engineering is just two doors down the road. Uh, we're not there tonight because we're closed for refurbishment as we have been for six months or so, but we will reopen in a couple of months with completely refurbished facilities which will be fantastic and we really do look forward to welcoming you all there uh, once we have uh, reopened. But in the meantime, over the next couple of months, we have a whole series of really interesting lectures, debates and events. And do go on to our website. Um, it's probably a bit old-fashioned compared with what we've been talking about today, but there's lots of information there on the events that we, we have upcoming, and, uh, and you will be most welcome uh, to those. But it would be uh, remiss of me not to thank, uh, firstly, Nigel for delivering uh, a superb talk uh, this evening on, on a really important and interesting topic uh, for all sorts of reasons and for so expertly answering Roger's questions and the questions uh, from the floor, but also to, to thank Roger for hosting the conversation so brilliantly. So before we break, if I could ask you all to thank them both again. Thank you.